When you come to a fork in the road, take it. Those were the words of New York Yankee great Yogi Berra. Maybe you are familiar with what they call Berryisms. They're, they're these little quippy quotes that he had that some people think he was just a country bumpkin and didn't get things and said things. And they're like, ha, 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 he, he didn't know what he's talking about. But the truth is, if you look back at his life, you'll realize he was quite intelligent and he had an irony to his wry writ, uh, wry wit, you know, his uh, little berryisms. Again, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. And you go, well, take it to the left or take it to the right? And you go, exactly. It, uh, don't go right up the middle, right? The, the, when you come to something that splits in one direction or another, take it. And he said these words in uh, to a you know, sportscaster, he was, they loved to quote him. He was also a guy, he said, uh, baseball is 90% mental and the other half is physical. Um, but, and, and you go, hmm. Uh, but when you look at this quote here, this is college commencement season, right? He will get quoted a lot. Actually, this is one of the most popular quotes to quote in a commencement speech, to tell seniors as they go out there when you come to a fork in the road take it and seniors probably some of them go I, I don't even know what that means I don't know why that might be funny or ironic in any sense they're like okay yeah whatever I will but if you ponder what that means it's more than a nonsensical funny one-liner or just like one of those little circular things that doesn't make much sense. It's more than a memorable way of saying, just go with your gut. It doesn't matter whether you take a left or right, as long as you make a good decision to follow your heart. You know, don't just go straight into the woods or whatever, or run into the wall. It's actually a very deep thought when you understand the wider context. See, it's not widely known, but he did actually elaborate on this quote, that the, just the quote is well known, but the elaboration, a, a reporter asking, Yogi, what exactly did you mean by that? And he talked about with that reporter where the idea actually came from. He was actually giving driving directions to a friend who was visiting Yogi's country house for the first time. And on the way to Yogi's house, there's a fork in the road. But it didn't matter whether you went to the left or the right because at the fork in the road, it was actually a circular, long circular drive. And so you could go either way and end up in the same exact place. And so this is what he would tell, he told this friend and it became such a thing that he would tell everyone on the way to their house and they would always hang up on it in the same way. He'd just tell them in the directions and then when you get to the fork in the road, take it. And they'd say, well, like, like what, what do you mean? What, which way? And he said, just take it. And so they would get there and they'd sit there and they'd look to the left and look to the right and think, well, what am I supposed to do? And this was before the day of cell phones and all those sorts of things. So they just had to pick one. But this is what's great. Regardless of whether they went to the left, they got to Yogi's house. And if they went to the right, they got to Yogi's house. But if they sat there at the fork in the road forever... They would just run out of gas and end up walking or getting frustrated and having to go back. And so his statement, though it at first wrinkled many brows, there were people who got an aha moment and went, ah, see, he's not just a country bumpkin. He knows a little bit about what he's talking about. Because again, when the road is a circle, it really doesn't matter. If you go left at the fork, you get in the same spot. But being a Christian is facing a different decision. In fact, being a person is facing a different decision. Not everything's just a fork in the road on a circular drive. And so when I think about this, we, when we face the crossroad, here would be my speech. You know, it's kind of funny that the, even Davidson, I believe, is having their commencement right across the street. And maybe, you know, people are giving advice to people. But if I could give advice to people, it would be when you come to the crossroad, take it. When you come to the crossroad, take it. And that might, again, seem like one of these things like so cryptic, doesn't make sense. Now, well, it should after today. The crossroad, the dictionary gives two definitions. The word is used in a literal sense, in some sense, right? It's a point where two streets meet. 
and go off in completely different directions. See, a crossroad is a perpendicular place. It's not a circular place. It's not a parallel place. It is a perpendicular place. And when you think even of the shape of a cross, it's perpendicular, right? It's not a X like this with, you know, a little bit of ver variety in the angle. It is a 90 degree perpendicular place where you either go that way or you go that way. But you can't go either way and end up in the same spot. And so unlike Yogi's road, not all roads lead to the same spot eventually. And if you're driving in your car and you come to a crossroads, it's an opportunity to decide, well, I like the direction I'm going. I want to keep going the direction I'm going. Or it's actually a place perpendicular where you could end up in a completely different spot depending on that decision. So it is a place to decide. And so the second definition of crossroads can be used in the figurative sense. And I'm using it, of course, this way today as well, which is a decision point. The crossroads is a place, a time for people to pick their path, right? There are lots of times in life where you can just go along a road and there isn't a decision, right? There isn't a fork in the road. There isn't a turn off from the road, there's just a road and you're just on it and you don't have to make lots of decisions. I actually like those. My wife knows I like those very much because I'm a guy who can drive forever in a direction, right? I can, I could be a great over the road trucker as long as I don't have to find my exit, right? And so for me, it's an amazing thing and an amazing thought to just say, well, uh, we're going and we're going to keep going, hammer down, right? <laughs> and just, woo, I can go in that direction. But then decision come, points come, and sometimes I get really nervous. I'm like, what? I need, who is it? Which one is it? What do you mean get in the left to go right and then bear left and bear, you know, stay to the left? And you're like, the GPS is telling me all kinds of stuff. Those are anxiety-producing moments when you have to decide. But the crossroads, the word has one more meaning, and you won't find it in the dictionary. You'll really find it in the Bible, and it's mainly what I focus on today, which is the crossroad which is the road to the cross. And ironically, as you look at the Gospels, they're good news, but they have plenty of bad news in them as well. And when you think about the life of Jesus, it was an amazing life, but all four Gospels do head toward a fairly tragic event that we already know about, right? And so we can cover it in gold, we can paint it white and put it in uh, places and say, oh, the cross, the glory of the cross. But remember, when Jesus was talking to people about it. It wasn't glory that was on their mind. It was gory that was on their mind. And Mark 8.34 has this passage that maybe you've heard in different ways, but it's Jesus calling his followers and saying, when you come to the crossroad, take it. When you come to the crossroad, take it. Mark 8.34, he says, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. What's he saying? I, I'm telling you, you want to take the cross road. Now, what's funny about it is just looking at it at the surface, you would think the last thing on earth I would ever want to do is take the cross road. Again, if you think about commencement speeches and you're talking to seniors and there was truly a thing of crucifixion, would you say, this is my hope, my goal for all of you that you would experience in this life, crucifixion. Yes, that's what I want for each and every one of you. You'd go, get this guy off the stage. This guy's got to go. This is not good advice to your kids or to anyone. But this is what Jesus was saying to his followers. He says, I'm going to the crossroad. I'm going at this decision point. I'm heading that direction, staying on that road to the cross. And I invite you, when you get to the crossroad, take it. You go, oh, okay, well, if it was just me giving you that advice, if it was even Mark giving you that advice, I'm not sure I would be as quick to think it through on the same level, but Jesus is the guy giving me this. So this is what it says, the halfway point in the book of Mark, and it's a crossroads, it's a turning point, it's an intersection. And for me, I even find it fascinating that though this is a, a short book, it, I, we're not going to get through it before the summer intermission, so to speak, right? Uh, but don't know what all different teachings I might get to do from the road, but they might not all be in this sequence. So we might have to wait and see what happens with some of this stuff till after that. But the book of Mark goes in a very different direction after Mark chapter 8. The first eight chapters of Mark have been establishing who Jesus is. 
that he's the Messiah, that he's the Christ, that he is the anointed one, that he's God as a man, that he's uh, a, a person with the authority to, to say when he says, follow me, you might want to listen. And Mark has been showing us miracle after miracle after miracle that this guy's doing. All of these messages that he's doing, even in summarized form. I mean, he's just given little quips sometimes, little quotes from Jesus, not the whole speech. It's, it's like, boom, just little pieces of advice from Jesus. He's calming the storm. He's walking on water. He's you know, feeding the multitudes with wonder bread there. He's restoring the sight of the blind. You know, He's, he's raising the dead. He's, he's sending the demons packing. And you think about this and you go, wow, he's, he's established. If you believe anything that Mark's saying, beyond a shadow of a doubt, this Jesus is no mere mortal, right? He's not just a normal guy. He's not just a godly guy. He's God as a guy. And, and when you think about that, that was tough for even his disciples in the first century to understand. His first followers had plenty of trouble figuring this out too. They didn't just immediately gullibly say, well, I think this guy's God. They said, I, I think he's pretty good. He's a good teacher. He's smart. This guy is amazing, you know. And he didn't come up to set an earthly kingdom up, but that's what they joined for. When he said, you want to follow me, they're like, overthrow Rome? Yes, I've been wanting to do that. I hate their track structure. I don't like the way they treat us. I don't like the lack of ability. I get to be my own boss and all that stuff. And that's what they signed up for. You see it when you really pay attention. And so Jesus came to put him on a different road, not the road to ruin Rome, but the road called the crossroad. And so you're going to see this question asked in this chapter, who do you say I am? And you know, there are a lot of wrong answers to that. It's like many things. There's a ton of wrong answers. There's an infinite, near infinite, infinite number of wrong answers to the question, who do you say Jesus is? I've heard some very interesting ones. But there's really only one answer on the inside that a person can come to that puts them on the crossroad that Jesus was talking about. And that's why he puts this question to his followers. From this moment on in Mark, I just tell you, the tone of Jesus' teaching takes a very sharp turn. It's really only about one thing. He keeps talking about the cross. They're like, what? why do you keep getting on that? I mean, we're really interested in a lot of the other things you have to say. And he says, Let, let's talk about the cross again. Let's talk about the fact that I'm going to die pretty soon. And they're like, I don't want to talk about that. That's not what people are coming out to hear. People want to hear about your cool miracle or something. He says, yeah, I'm going to do a miracle. They're going to kill me. Uh, and you'll see the greatest miracle of all. You know, and he keeps focusing on this, and the disciples don't get it. And spiritually, they're like the blind man that we saw last week uh, that Jesus healed with two touches. Remember that guy where I said sometimes just things take a while to see clearly? Well, it took a while for them, and you know, frankly, it takes a while for me. I know you're all very quick learners, and the minute God shows you something, you understand it right away, but not my case. My case, in my life, there's things I'm still figuring out. Did you know that part of the reason I think it's important for me to take a little bit of time as a teacher over the summer is so that I have something to teach? Because there's a point where if you just teach what you already know or you teach what you've already experienced, it's like, where's the freshness? Where's the reality of the fact that God is teaching the teacher? Where is that? And so when you think about this, the disciples didn't understand. It would be very arrogant for me to think that someone standing next to Jesus had trouble, but I won't. I'll get it right away. See, and when you think about that fuzzy sight that that guy had where he said, well, I see people walking around as trees, and Jesus touches him again. He goes, oh, wow, I see clarity. Um, and, and, and you think about that, we all need that. And so this is what I hope you'll have resonate in your life that when you come to the crossroad, take it. If you remember nothing else, just you're going to come to the crossroad in your life numerous times probably. That's why he even said, take up your cross daily. He said, you're gonna come to this and this decision and when you come to it, take it, take it. If somebody says something else, say, I, I choose the cross. I choose the crossroad. And see, when we pick up today's teaching in verse 30, 27, this is what you're going to see. Jesus walking down the road with his disciples. What road was it? Well, for them, it was a crossroad, right? And it was a funny thing because it was a physical place that they're going out of town and towns have these roads. And I love the way Jesus just used the moment 
for the message. He's going to do that for you. If there's one thing that I had a student reflect back to me that was the most profound thought is I told him, listen to your life. God is speaking to you through your life. He's, uh, he said, I love the way you bring things from your life into teachings. And I said, I'm just trying to listen to my life. Some teacher told me, listen to your life. God's talking to you through your life. And I said, don't listen just to my life, my goofy or dorky stories. Listen to your life. You're going to make dorky stories of your own. Listen to them and learn from them and love them and embrace them. And so this is what's happening. Jesus is just walking along with the road with them. And he says, hey, uh, when you get to the <laughs> crossroad, take it. What does he mean? Verse 27, Jesus and his disciples went out of the towns of Caesarea Philippi. And on the road, he asked his disciples, saying to them, who do men say that I am? And so they answered, John the Baptist, but some say Elijah and others one of the prophets. Now I stopped there real quickly because again, think of the first question he asked him. He didn't go right to who do you think I am? He asked a more generic and easier to answer question, which is, so what's the buzz about me out there? You guys have your ear to the ground, right? You, you hear what people are whispering out in the crowd. Who do people say that I, I am? And, and they get the the multiple choice question, right? The all roads lead to the right answer. Well, some people say John the Baptist. That's right. Some people do say that. And then he goes, uh, uh, some say Elijah. And he goes, I, that's right. That's one of the rumors out there, isn't it? So they're going for these, in a way, more generic, less personal, less pointed answers. And he says, one of the prophets, just one of those good guys, man. There's been lots of good guys over the years and you're one of them. And then verse 29, he said to them, but who do you say that I am? <laughs> See, I think if there's a single question on the test of life, it's right there. There it is. I can get a lot of questions wrong, but I can't get that one wrong. And so this is one of the thoughts I have of the crossroad. When you get to it, take it, because you can make a lot of mistakes on it. Oh, man, did these guys make mistakes on the crossroad. They even took it and still didn't know what they were doing half the time. They made mistakes all the way along the crossroad, but they did not make the mistake of being perpendicular to the truth, right? And I think that's really important because some people think, oh man, I got to get it all right to go on the road to follow Jesus. No, you can get it wrong. You just can't make the mistake of not taking that road, but you can make all kinds of mistakes on that road. Does it mean you should? No, hopefully we make fewer and fewer as we go down that road with him. But you know what? You're going to run out of gas. You're going to listen to the wrong thing on the radio while you're on that road. You're going to end up in the ditch sometime. You're going to be changing flat tires. You're going to do all kinds of stuff. You're going to have arguments in the car, but you are on the road. And that is really crucial. And I, I, I love to say to kids so many times, you know, don't think you've got to get it all right before you even get on the right road. It's getting on the right road is where you get it right. And you're still gonna get it wrong, so, just like they did. So look at this, Peter answered and says to him, you're the Christ. Now here's what you gotta know, Peter kinda had the teacher's edition. He'd been looking over Jesus' shoulder, right? So it wasn't like he was some super genius, right? He had gotten many things wrong up until this point, and here's what's great, he answers most questions wrong after this. But he got one right, he says, <laughs> Uh, you're the Messiah. And he's walking and talking with Jesus. I love it. And the first question, again, very generic. The second question, very specific. And what I love about this is like, if you pay any attention, you're going to see so many different answers to who Jesus was. I mean, I think, you know, again, commencement. This is one of the things, if I can editorialize for just a minute, because there's parents in the room and there's kids in the room. And when I think about this, one of the things that people are deathly afraid of, of course, is that their kids will make wrong decisions in life, right? I, I mean, and, and rightly so. I mean, we know the consequences of choices. We live in some of the consequences of choices sometimes. But what's interesting is a lot of times people want to make sure that everyone knows what is everyone out there saying or preparing you for these very difficult questions. Like, you know, what can you argue why it isn't Elijah or why Jesus wasn't John the Baptist? There were always wrong ideas out there and there's always gonna be wrong ideas out there. But Peter gets 
something where, you know, if you read magazines, there's always going to be in search of the real Jesus. You know, they come out with that one every year. And there's new evidence that he was actually a figment of somebody's imagination or something like that. And you go, okay. Those arguments are always going to be out there. I don't even worry about those things. He's not a figment of my imagination. He, I have fought with this guy. If he's a figment of my imagination, he's beat me up pretty good over the years. You know, and when I think about this, the magazines and programs, I don't worry about those things. I don't even try to shield my kids from those things. I just say, hey, listen, I can tell you this. You can make a ton of mistakes in life. Just don't throw baby Jesus out with the bathwater. You're going to run into people who are going to say dumb things and do th dumb things in Jesus' name, and that does not change one whit who this guy was, right? And if you look at the wider context, sometimes you'll look at a quote of Jesus, and I, I heard Jesus said this, and you, do you understand what that even means? Do you understand what that means in the context of how he treated the people he was with? and what he was saying to that person and why. And so this is what you see. I, I would much rather concern myself with the person of Jesus and soak people in that than knowing all the answers to who he wasn't. Because man, there's an infinite list of who he wasn't, but there's one answer to who he was. And once I understand that, I don't even really have to care too much about who he wasn't. So think about this. Jesus asks, who do men say that I am? But he's really headed toward a much more important question. <laughs> who do you say I am? Because I can have all the right answers to all those other questions. And if I get this one wrong, I'm still wrong. So I think about this. Having it inside, Jesus called me to the crossroad. If I can just internalize one thing for any person I meet, it's when you get to the crossroad, take it. If you get to the crossroad, take it. Yeah, but what about all the other options? You go, oh, well, I don't know about all the other options. There's a lot of options. You can come to one of those spaghetti highway things where it's like, well, what about this thinker or that thinker? And I go, well, I don't know, man. I've chased some of those roads and none of them led to anything that led to the crossroad. The crossroad has led to everything great in my life. So I think about this, Jesus, I stand on what he said, John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to God except through me. It's not a circular drive to God's house. Jesus called me to the crossroad, and here's what's hard about it. It's the hard road. It's not the easy road. It's not the road of, of least resistance. It's, it's gravel sometimes. It's, it's muddy sometimes. It's thorny sometimes. It's narrow always. But here's what's funny about it. I've thought about this. You know what? But you got to be pretty open-minded on the narrow road, <laughs> you know? It's not really narrow thinkers that I've found that really thrive on the narrow road to the cross. It's open-hearted, open-minded people who embrace what God is doing. And there are a lot of wrong answers out there on who Jesus is, but there's only really an answer that he gave. And Peter gives it, you're the Christ. And Matthew 16 adds that he says, the son of the living God. So Mark only gives us the cliff notes, but you know this is quite a confession. He's, he pretty much throws every um, you know, answer. You've taken tests like that where you're like, you're pretty sure you know the answer, but you just add every vocabulary word you know. So there's like no way the teacher can miss that you know, you are the son of the living God, the Messiah, the son of David, the one who is to come and prophesied from the prophets, you know, and you're like, okay, Peter, I got it. You know it, you got the answer. And you can pretty much picture Peter because you've been him at times and you've not been him at times and wished you were, but it's that kid who knows the answer when you don't, right? And I can picture Peter just like, patting himself on the back, right? <laughs> I got that one, nailed it. You know, extra credit. And if the rest of you 11 have any questions, which I'm sure you do, you can just come to me for those answers because Jesus is very bit busy. And then you see verse 30, Jesus strictly warned him, don't tell anyone about me. Don't tell anyone. Why, why was this? I think it's an interesting thing. Again, there's lots of interesting things in this chapter, but who do I say that I am? Well, the road to the crown goes by way of the cross. That's what we're going to see, just a thought there, right? There is something past the cross, which is really important. When it's the cross road, it's also the crown road, right? And we just had that royal wedding also this weekend, which has everyone, lo everyone loves the idea of the crown. Oh, the crown. Um, but in God's economy, it's the same road, right? You, go, you just keep driving past the cross. Just a little while later, there's the crown, right? That's where it is. And so 
when you think about this, Jesus knew that this was such a difficult, easy concept to get that he needed to tell it to people. His disciples would have very little capacity to tell it to people. I don't know if you've recognized this yet. Um, I, I'm recognizing it and continuing to recognize it. I make a horrible Holy Spirit. All right? I, make a, I make a terrible Holy Spirit in my wife's life. I make a terrible Holy Spirit in my kid's life. I make a terrible Holy Spirit in your life. There are things I can't tell you, and if I tell them to you, they sound really condescending or pedantic, right? I mean, they sound just like, who are you to tell me that? And you're like, well, I'm nobody, I guess. But God can tell me things that nobody else can tell me. God can set me straight on something that anyone else, I'll, oh, yeah? Well, who are you? You've got flaws, but I can't say that to God. Oh, yeah, well, you, okay, well, you're right. Um, and there's just things that God can do in a person's life that I can't do. And I know a lot of pastors who try to be the Holy Spirit in a person's life. I know a lot of husbands who try to be their spouse is Holy Spirit. You know, I'm, I'm going to tell you how to obey God, you know, and you go, no, that's, that's not going to be very successful. And so I see Jesus not wanting the message to get out through his disciples too much because they still didn't get it. Peter gave a great theological answer, but he did not understand still what it meant. He, you know when you can get the right answer and you don't, and then the teacher asks a probing question and you're like, Oh, I, didn't, I don't know, that wasn't in the book. Um, you know, I, I just memorized the definition. I don't know what it means. What is, how does it apply? I don't know. What did Yogi Berra mean by uh, fork in the road? I don't know. There's, that's why he was saying, don't, don't just go quoting me until you understand <laughs> what I mean. So he says it strongly. It's strictly, he warned them, don't tell anyone. Don't, don't go off and do your thing. And when I think about this, the crossroad is such an important thing that for people to miss his message, for me to mess up the message of God, is, is a sobering thought. It's, it's, a very, it's a difficult thought for me. I mean, I would rather say nothing to someone than send them on the wrong road. This has really been a, a lifelong uh, weight of a sense of being a teacher, that I'm like... I mean it when I say, but what do I know? I don't want to send a kid off on, here's, I've got the answer for your life. You should be this and you should go to study this and do all that. I, I, who am I to say that? Um, here, what I can tell them is some bedrock truths that, man, if you approach everything you do with wonder and with joy and with uh, humility and with a belief that God's going to do it, God will take you on roads. You have no idea. So that's why I say most questions, when you get to a fork in the road, take it. Go left. But what if I go wrong? Are you on the crossroad? On the crossroad, there's a trillion different options. That's what I love about the Bible. It says God takes you in through the narrow gate and wides you out to pasture. What does that mean? The restrictions on the righteous life are far fewer than most people believe. And when you really look at it, it's the path of freedom. And it's where God says, I don't know, take a left. Yeah, but I, I think I'm supposed to go do this, but I really love doing that. And God says, then do it. Is it sin? No. Then do it. Yeah, but everyone thinks I should do this. And you go, who cares what everyone thinks? That's what Jesus is asking. What do people think? Well, they think this. Everyone's answers are wrong. When you get to the fork in the road, take it. There have been times in my life, I think we, Len and I have come to experience this freedom not because people told it to us, but God showed it to us repeatedly that we're like, we'd come to a fork in the road and we panic because we're like, we don't wanna get it wrong. Uh, okay, God, show us which way. And he's like, take it, take a fork in the road. Go, go here and I'll bless you. Follow me and, and, and you'll meet people and God will be there and, and you'll learn and everything. And you go, but what if I do this instead? I'll be there and I'll bless you and you'll meet people and you're like, to live in that joy of realizing, yeah, I can't, you mean I, when I'm on the right road, I can't get it wrong? Yeah, you can't get it wrong. God's going to be there in all those spots. So he, he tells him, this is an upper division class, Peter. You're not going to get it to people very well till you've experienced it some yourself. And so I love this thought, the misrepresentation of the Messiah. He says, just, just let me do the teaching for now. And verse 31, he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders 
and the chiefs, priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. So remember what I said, that this book takes a turn. It's, it's hitting the crossroad right here. Boom. You know, Jesus has established, I have the answer book. I am the answer, right? It's not that I have the answers. It's that I am the answer. And then when they go, yeah, yeah, you know what you're talking about. He says, okay, you, th you believe, Peter, that I know what I'm talking about? Well, let me tell you guys what I'm talking about. I'm going to be rejected by the people who think they have the religious answers. I'm going to be killed, but that's not the end of the road. Death is not the end of the road. There's a crown after the cross, but you got to go through the cross to get to the crown. And they knew, again, they thought they knew what Jesus came to do, right? And I know in my life, I've thought I knew what Jesus came to do. He came to make my life better, right? He came to make my life easier. He came to give me all the answers I want. He came to bless every idea I ever had. He came to, you know, to basically take away the pain and, and put in the joy. Isn't that what the crocheted pillow at the Christian bookstore said, you know? And then you go, well, that's, that's part of the story. It is part of the story, but it's not all of the story. And so this is the story that Jesus thinks his disciples are old enough to understand at this point. He's like, didn't start with this one, but I'm taking you there. And he says, you need to know what I came to do. When you come to the crossroad, take it. When I come to the crossroad, I'm taking it. He said, remember that temptation that the uh, wilderness had for Jesus when he was hungry and all the rest, it was, don't take the crossroad. Just feed yourself apart from God's will. Do whatever makes everything okay right now. Don't suffer. Um, all the kingdoms of the world, all you got to do is bow down and worship me one time. You don't have to go this whole, uh, the cross thing, that's your dad's idea. Um, Satan had an idea, and his idea was, worship me once, one time, and you get everything. Shortcut. Man, that's a lot easier. Why were those things temptations to Jesus? Well, they were temptations to him because the question was, when you get to the crossroad, do you take it? Or do you take the road that says, come this way, much easier. And so I think about this, suffer, rejected, be killed. That's what the sign said, right? <laughs> What's ahead on the road? You know how you go on a road and it tells you the next stops like it says Miami 217 miles or something you're like okay and it's got the road signs this is what the road sign said for Jesus suffer 10 miles rejected 14 miles um you know die on the cross 22 miles and you're like what and then it has resurrect and enjoy the crown and give it out to everyone who follows and you go okay is there, is there a circular drive? Can I go a different way? Can I go a different route? The Bible prophesied it so plainly that it's impossible for us to miss now, but it was easy for them to miss, right? It's so easy to see things backwards. So that's why I think, you know, we shouldn't be too, you know, pleased as punch with our biblical understanding when we have the whole Bible sitting in front of us and searchable on Google, you know, and we're like, ha, <laughs> Peter the apostle, I can find that verse faster than you can. And you're like, but Isaiah 53, right? The suffering servant. You know, this one, they grew up knowing it, but it's easy to forget what we know. The perfect lamb would pay the price of forgiveness. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. We hid our faces from him. He was despised. We didn't hold him in high esteem. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. By his stripes were healed. And so it was obvious from all the prophets that the Messiah would choose the cross road. Right, that when he got to the road of the cross, he would choose it. But this was somehow missed in the message of the Messiah that was handed down generation to generation. It was he's gonna come and take us away from suffering, away from sorrow, away from difficulty, away from hardship. And he's gonna do that here and now. We're gonna get that lifted from our life now. We're gonna have the easy road. See, Daniel 9 was another of the prophetic passages, and it said this hundreds of years before Jesus faced that crossroad physically. It says, the Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. 
In other words, he's going to suffer not for his own self. He's going to suffer for you. He's going to suffer that you might believe him when he calls from the other side of the cross, it's worth it. Stay on this road, it's worth it. Did I say it was easy? Nope, it's worth it. And I have tried that message in honesty with everybody I've ever met where I say, it's not going to be easy, it's going to be worth it. It's not going to be easy, it's going to be worth it. People who say, oh, it's easy, it's not easy. It's hard, it is very difficult, it's extremely challenging, and it gets harder over time. It's actually harder down the road of faith, I believe, than it was to start it. Oh man, the last laps of any race are the hardest. Are you kidding me? And yet people, when they see that, they go, oh, don't, don't teach that, don't preach that. Jesus preached that. The scriptures preach that. The savior of the world will suffer and die. Oh, and rise again. Don't leave that off the end. And the Jewish people, again, you can't blame them, but they were expecting the Messiah to come as a conquering king to get them out of the thumb of Rome, out from under the iron hand, the iron fist of Rome. And they're like, bring me an easier life now. And the disciples' preconceived notions kept them hearing what they wanted to hear. I don't know if you have ever seen these things, but I'm fascinated by them. Um, there was one just this week that made the news, and I, I hate to get it back into your head if you haven't already heard it, but it's an audio um, illusion that is around the words Yanni and Laurel. Okay, some of you are like, heard this, so tired of it already. It's funny how we can be dead tired of something in a week. I mean, it goes from never heard of it to never want to hear it again in our modern society in a week. Can't that happen with yes. the gospel? Yes. And so here's what it is. It's an audio clip that's ambiguous, and some people hear one word from it, and some people hear another word from it. And I've heard both. I don't know what you hear, but depending on when I hear it and how I hear it, I've actually, if I stare at one of the words physically printed out, I hear that. And if I stare at the other word, I hear that from the same exact audio clip. I know enough about audio clip. I know the clip is not being manipulated because I have the software to check it. So I'm like, I know for sure it's possible for my brain to interpret two things differently in a different moment or two different people to hear two different things and be really angry that the other, why are you kidding me? How can you say you hear that? And you're like, uh, that's what they're hearing. See, and there's uh, this is a really cool thing. I went and looked up some other stuff, but. Look this one up. There's a guy who's got a, a, a video clip where he's saying ba, B-A, ba. It's called the McGruff effect uh, after the teacher who found it. Ba, ba, like this. Then it shows you a video of him going fa, fa. You can see his teeth doing the F and the F part, fa. You hear the change when you watch his lips. You close your eyes, you're going to hear ba, 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 all the way through. You open your eyes, you see the clip of him going, and you go, fa, and you can't stop it. I don't care how hard you try. I've tried it with people. You can't stop it, even knowing that your brain is doing it. And the reason is that God built into your brain your, your visual ability to take ambiguity and and bring it down so your your visual actually overrides your audio it's more important in the hierarchy of your brain and it's hardwired to be that way and so as soon as your brain sees it's not ba it's fa you're here you're missing the little silent part it's going to get you the right answer of what it's saying and i think about those things and i think to myself we hear what we want to hear man how many times have i read the bible and only heard the part I wanted to hear. I like that part. And then there's another part. I'm like, what? I didn't hear that. Um, and, and, and when I think about that, I, I think to myself, God is, was trying to do something in his disciples. They'd heard some of what he said, but they actually didn't like the first part. This is what's sad. They missed the best part because they didn't stay tuned for the message. He'd say, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to suffer. And right away their brain is, he ain't going to suffer. We're not going to suffer. They're talking between themselves. And I'm going to be rejected. And they're like, well, I ain't going to be rejected. I don't like that. And they missed and rise again. He said that and they never heard it. They never heard it in the Gospels from the, 
from the day he started saying it and saying it over and over again because all they did just got fixated on the suffering. And they're like, they're off on that tangent saying, no, 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 no. Their brain saying, no, 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 it does not compute. I don't want to hear that. And because they didn't want to hear that, you know what they didn't hear? The most glorious and amazing news they could have ever heard. So because they rejected the bad news, they also rejected the better news. And Jesus said the word suffer, they checked out, <laughs> right? And I've seen that happen in my life. I've seen it happen in yours. So when you, when you think about it, who do I, you say I am? One of the questions and answers with that is the easy way is the right way. That's what all of humanity will tell you. They'll just say, well, you don't deserve to be treated like that. You deserve better than that. You know, and you go, you're right. You are right. I don't deserve to be mistreated like that. Well, Jesus didn't deserve to be mistreated like this. Uh, so often when I'm sitting around office and even listening to myself, but I'll be listening to the tone of a conversation, I think to myself, of course, none of what we're saying right here has anything to do with what the Bible would tell us to react to this for. And that's a harsh reality, but I just like, wow, has anyone read the Bible lately? Because it answers all the questions we're we're back and forthing about right now about who gets to do this and who, well, I got, I worked extra hard. I deserve. And you're like, well, that's interesting. The Bible doesn't treat it that way at all. So who do I, who do you say I am? Um, the right way is the right way. I shouldn't be asking what's the easy way or what's the expeditious thing or what's the shortest mileage. You know, when you look at um, GPSs, they always do that. Hey, you can save 12 minutes going this way. And that's great for a physical truth, but you know what? If, if it's, well, you can shave off a lot of suffering off this way and you go, but is it right? Am I doing the right thing? Is right right or right wrong? And so this is what Jesus was always telling him, do the right thing. Look at this. He spoke the word openly. So he's talking very directly with his disciples. He tells them, don't go spreading this around because you'll mess it up. But let me say it so clearly to you. I, I, I'm not advocating that we as Christians walk around talking to every unbeliever about how they should suffer. You, you should suffer and suffer like I do and be miserable on the road like I am. And you go, no, 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 not at all. Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. <laughs> I love this. This is Jesus, you got the wrong answer, man. You know when a, a student tells a teacher, yeah, it's not right. Uh, you got the wrong answer. That can be true because teachers are fallible, but Jesus is not wrong here. So Peter goes, Psh. Listen, man, I got the last one right. I, I know this. And verse 33, he turned around and looked at his disciples. That means Jesus looked at his disciples. He rebuked Peter saying, get behind me, Satan. You're not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. See this slide that I put up there? Again, what is the things of man, the things of mankind, the things of humanity? Is it easy? What's the easy route? And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. You're, you're, you're trying to give me the answer that a person would give me instead of the answer that God would give me. And he's speaking very openly. Again, he's saying, I'm facing the crossroad, and when you get to the crossroad, take it, guys. And Peter says, don't tell him that, man. Jesus, get over here. You shouldn't take that road. Do you see what's on that sign? Suffering and rejection? You don't want that. You don't have that. You're the king, man. You are the king. And I can picture Peter, again, <laughs> you've let these Pharisees get to you, man. Man, they're like, they're taking you off your path. You are on a path to glory, man. You are on a path to greatness. You are a world changer. And you go, well, I don't know about that, man. Don't be so negative, Jesus. You're such a negative person, man. You're so pessimistic. Why? Come on, man. You got you to gotta positive out here. You're on the road to the crown. He says, I know. I just said it. I'm on the road to the crown. I told you that we got to make a little stop at the cross. And three days later, eternity. You understand that hugeness? But they missed that. So he rebukes him for his negativity. You're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. Remember question A? I just told you that. I get revelation from God. <laughs> Notice in verse 33, Jesus turned around and looked at his disciples. It's always the little verse parts that really fascinate me. Jesus, before he answers Peter, looks at the disciples. I don't know if he was looking to see if they were paying attention, but I personally believe he looked at them to gain the human power to say the right thing and to take the crossroad. He looked at them and said, for them, if I take the personal path of pleasure for me, the easy route for me, 
I betray all of these guys. That guy's going to betray me right over there. But I betray all of them, and not even the ones that will be just in this room, but all who will ever believe. He looked at them, and there's times in my life where I think if you want a tip on how not to blow it, look at the people in your life who you would betray if you did. All you have to do is just look and go, crossroad crossroad when you get to the crossroad take it god wouldn't want you to suffer you don't deserve that do you understand these people don't even appreciate you crossroad take it notice verse 33 jesus when he's looking it's as if andrew james john and the rest he was thinking if i save myself i don't save them if i save myself i don't save them it's me or them and if i don't take this crossroad no one will <laughs> Uh, and if I don't go this way to the crown, nobody gets it. And so he says, get behind me, Satan. There's some who think that, you know, he was really slamming Peter. I don't think he was slamming Peter at all. I think he was looking past Peter to the one behind Peter and, in, you know, invisibly behind Peter. He's just identifying the source. He didn't say, Peter, you moron. <laughs> he says, Satan, Peter... You're just, just as much as you can be used by God in one moment, you can be used of Satan in the next. Just, just I'm, I'm going to identify the source of that, and I'm not taking the shortcut. The crossroad is the one I'm taking. It's a clear contrast, and I love that because the way of man always says the easy way is the best way, and the <laughs> way of God says the right way is the right way always and forever. And so that's the central verse that I get to with you in verse 34. When he called the people to himself with his disciples also, Notice he had told the disciples, don't go tell people, but he calls people to himself because this is such a personal call of God on someone's life that I really think it's best heard from him. Whoever desires to come after me, let him desire, I'm sorry, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. He intentionally calls a crowd to hear those words, not just talking to the 12. He talked to the 12 plenty. And the, the word that jumped out for me is desires. And I put this down, which is discipleship has to start with inside desire, not outside pressure. It has to start there. You know, I can't pressure somebody into making the right decision at the right time in God's economy. Because if I do, I might hear what Jesus said to these guys. Hey, keep that to yourself, man. You're, you're actually, your timing's way off. <laughs> you're, they're, they're, they're you're telling them to turn and they're about like a hundred yards from the right spot right now. I know what's going on in their life. And that doesn't mean God never uses us as an agent to influence and, and all the rest of that. But the, it's just this. He says, whoever desires this, it's not, I desire it for you. It's that, do I desire it for me? Do you desire it for you? That's the question. And it starts with that inside desire because that's the only thing that's going to keep someone on a crossroad. If I try to talk someone into a crossroad, they will be looking for the next exit. They will be looking for the next turnaround. You know, official use only. I don't know if, uh, when I was growing up, we saw those signs that said, no, you turn and say like official use only on the highway. And my friend used to just use it and say, I am officially using this turn. Um, and, and it, but I don't think the police officers would have appreciated that if they'd caught him in it. But you think about that, that's what someone will be doing. If I pressure them into it, life will pressure them back out. So over time in my life, I just look at it and say, man, inward desire. If someone has an inward desire, man, I share that inward desire. I would love to walk that road with you because we don't walk the crossroad alone, but we have to make the decision alone. I can't make that decision for somebody else. I can't stay on that road for somebody else. I can't do anything other than say, I'm following Jesus. He said, when I get to the crossroad, take it. I'm sharing that with you. He's going to share that with you. And if you want to take it, let's take it together. At least we go together. I've done some scary things in my life. And I always say, on the count of three, <laughs> we'll do it together. You know, we'll jump off that 10 meter board. We'll just run off the end of it together. You know, and I think about those things. And I think, yeah, God has graciously given us plenty of people to walk this road with it. But it is a road where it's, it's a personal decision that somebody has to make. The cross road is one that you have to desire. You have to decide it. Because he talks about three things there. He says, deny yourself, take up the cross, and follow me. The denying of self means that I can't deny yourself for you. <laughs> you know, I can't deny who you are. You need to decide who you are and who you want to be. And no 
no will imposed from the outside is going to do that. You know, and, and when I think about that, I can't tell somebody, you, you need to stop living this way and start living this way any more than Jesus can do that. Because Jesus did that to some people and they said, no thanks, no thanks. And he didn't consider himself a failure as far as I can see. He just simply said, this is the way I'm going. Here's why. And follow me if you like. And here's what it's going to involve. The world revolves around me. If I'm still thinking that way, I'm not going to deny myself. I'm not going to deny myself anything. I'm going to indulge myself. I'm going to, you know, go buy Self Magazine or Me Magazine, me.com, you know. That's, that's all I want to know. Where's some more me? And he says, it's denying that. And then take up your cross. And again, taking up your cross falls different on their ears than on ours. You know, it's like me saying, grab your guillotine, folks, slip your noose around your neck, and let's go. And you go, that's, that's what they, they would have been, what do you mean cross? You know, it wasn't a gold thing with a little diamond in the middle of it to them. It was different. And that's not to say that someone can't, can't wear that as a remembrance that the cross was flipped from glory to glory in God's word, you know. We understand that now. But to them, they were like, put up, put, grab your cross. And the thing to remember is, I've heard it. You've heard it. Maybe you've said it. Some people think their kids are their cross to bear. Well, it's just my cross to bear. Or my spouse, it's just my cross to bear. A cross is something that Jesus says here, you take up willingly and without complaint, right? I mean, it's not the thing, oh, it's imposed upon me, but I just got to drag it from here to eternity. He said, if you desire this, do this. If you want, don't want to do it, don't do it. If you want to do it, do it. This is what it is. To say, you know what? No to me and yes to God. And you know what? No to the easy route and yes to the right route. I'll take right over easy. Okay, I want that. I desire that. It's going to hurt. It's going to be hard. Okay, that's fine. Uh, if I impose that on a student, they won't last the first semester. They won't last the first week. But if I tell them, you want this? Like if somebody comes to me, I, I have a long illustration. I'm a, I, I've used it for a long time. It's a short illustration. Don't worry, we're almost done. But it's this, that someone says, I want to be an Olympic athlete. Oh, you do? Okay, well, uh, let's, let's start your eating regime. You know, you're going to have to cut out these foods and start the, oh, I don't want to do that. Well, then you don't want to be an Olympic athlete. No, I do. I want to be an Olympic athlete. And you go, okay, well, uh, practice starts at 5. Oh, I got to work after school. I can't be there. Well, that's good because it's 5 a.m. actually. It's not 5 p.m. You go, oh, well, I, I, I like to, I'm really more not a morning person. You go, well, then you don't want to be an Olympic athlete. There's a point where your desire has to line up with your decision, right? And it, it, there's a point where you say, I'm, I want this. This is what I want. This is what I want more than other things. And the reason, this is the real reason for me, and this is what I share with you, is because it's, it's the one that leads to life. It's the one that leads to the Father's house. I am as convinced of that as anything as I could possibly be convinced of it. I'm flexible on almost everything else, but I'm pretty sure, very sure, the cross leads to the crown and it's the only way you get there. That everything else is a lie and that's the one truth. There is one truth that the cross road, when you get to the cross road, take it. There's going to be a whole lot of other decisions, not as important, not as crucial. Might take a detour here and there and whoops, but the cross road, take it. Looking back at Mark 8.31, why? I will rise again. I don't know anyone else who did that. I know a lot of people who love to do that. But I don't know anyone else who did it and talked from the grave and afterwards and came back like Jesus did. And crucifying the sinful self, actually what's funny about it, this is where he says it. Look at this, verse 35, 36, 37. I can't say it better than Jesus did. Whoever desires to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake in the Gospels will save it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? What would a man give in exchange for his soul? Those are rhetorical questions, but you're like, I think I could get the answer right on that, and I didn't even study. Um, <laughs> what would be, let's see, your soul, um, give you a house for it. And you're like, eh, I don't even need to look at the house. Oh, give you a car for it. I don't need to look at the car. There isn't anything in the balance that I could say, my soul? What am I going to sell that for? And notice he says, you desire to save your life. It was desires. It's the competing of desires. 
And the paradox there is he says, you want to you lose your life? You, wanna, uh, you desire to have everything for you? Just chase everything for you. You'll lose it. You want the paradox? You want to find what real life's about? He says, stop thinking so much about you. <laughs> stop thinking about so much about whether, oh, well, it, it could be hard. It could hurt. It hurts right now. And you go, don't even think about that stuff. Think about what's the goal and what's it worth. What, don't ask, is it easy? Ask, is it worth it? Ask the better questions. A selfish life is a dead end. You know, so it looks great at the entrance and it's dead at the end. And you don't have to believe Jesus to believe that. You can just look at all the people who've made these decisions over the course of a life. And Jesus finishes the chapter by saying, if you're ashamed of me in my words, I, I, I'll be ashamed of you when my time comes. And you might say, well, that's not fair. But he's, he's just basically saying, look, man, you choose me now. I'll choose you then. You didn't want me now. Why would I force you to spend eternity with me? You didn't want to spend a little time on the road with me. Why would you think that? Because the only reason someone would want that is they say, but I want the crown without the cross. I'm just finding the alternate route. And Jesus went down the crossroad. He went down that road and he would never call you to go anywhere he hasn't already been. He already knows where it goes. And he says, this is the right road, I promise you. Not the easy road, but the right one. What do others say? Well, who cares what others say? What do you say? That was the course of this question. And that's the crossroad question for you, for me. I can't answer it for you. I can only answer it for me. And he says, when you get to the crossroad, take it. Life just got pretty simple for me. All I gotta ask at any point, <laughs> what's the crossroad? I can't see the crown. I don't understand the crown. The crown is past the cross. And it's, you can't see it because the cross is in the way. But on the other side of the suffering is the joy that Jesus said was there. So what do others say? Well, they say a lot of things, but I know what Jesus said. And he said, don't, don't spread the message till you understand the message. The best way sometimes to do it is just by our choices and say, that person, you know what? When it came to the easy thing or the right thing, they chose the right thing. When they came to a cross in the road, they took it. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity we have to make a daily choice, uh, the realization that this choice will face us over and over and over again, and we might have even made some wrong decisions along the way, and that's part of the process. Look at the people you worked with and what you did with them and how many times they would go off in a ditch or off on a detour or even think they were had it right when they still had, didn't have it figured out. And I pray that as we listen to our life that we would be able to answer the question for ourselves and be somebody who provides in some way the encouragement for others who are on the road to. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. You can put your tassels to the other side. Um, <laughs>